This episode is brought to you by Carnegie Mellon's Tepper School of Business. Want to advance your career or switch fields? An MBA from Carnegie Mellon's Tepper School of Business can help. Earn your degree from a top-ranked business school with a thought-provoking curriculum, one-on-one leadership coaching, support from experienced career counselors, and full-time online hybrid and accelerated MBA formats. Join the intelligent future. Visit cmu.edu slash Tepper to learn more. This episode is brought to you by Shopify. That's the sound of switching your business to Shopify, the global commerce platform that supercharges your selling. Harness the best converting checkout and same intuitive features, trusted apps, and powerful analytics used by the world's leading brands. Stop leaving sales on the table. Discover why millions trust Shopify to build, grow, and run their business. Sign up today for your $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash tech23. Welcome to the Artificial Intelligence Podcast with your host, Dr. Tony Huang. Today, I'm with Anna Marie Wagner. Anna Marie, do you want to give a quick intro about yourself? Sure, happy to. Um, So I'm the head of AI as well as the head of corporate development for Ginkgo Bioworks, which is building a platform for cell programming. So think about that like computer programming, but for cells, for biological machines, um, as well as a platform for biosecurity. Cool. So um, like in synthetic biology, it's often described as like programming cells, like computers, like, can you elaborate on that type of analogy? Yeah, absolutely. So if we all know computers run on code, you know, you've got kind of human readable code, you know, like Python, you know, hey, uh, you know, write me a program that does these things. And it's kind of human readable, it's abstracted, that turns into machine code, a bunch of zeros and ones, a bunch of bits that your computer recognizes to operate all of these functions. Well, it turns out that biology runs on code too. It happens to be ACTG, uh, not zero and one, but it is digital code. And that digital code tells our cells, which you can think of like little computers, hey, make this protein and that protein is going to do some function. Or, you know, if you see this antigen make this antibody like it is it is logic gated programming uh and the goal at ginkgo is to make that engineerable like if you think about the field of biology over the past call it 50 plus years um even in the more modern age it's really a field of discovery right like people call it drug discovery not drug engineering and ginkgo would like to turn that on its head the idea being well what if we could make a medicine for Tony and not just find some medicine in some plant somewhere that hopefully works for Tony, but might also be something you're allergic to. Right. And and so if we can figure out actually how this code works, what it means, what it does, how it interacts with other machines and other code, then we can, we can forward program it uh, to do the things that we want it to do. So you guys recently had a partnership with Google. Is that correct? We did. Yeah. So like, how did you get an introduction to like Google? That's a, that's a pretty big brand name company. Yeah. Well, look, when we think about AI and biology, um, it's really a field that we think has been held back by a lack of, of data, of, of the type of data that's relevant for training, like really powerful models in, 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 you know, in, in the way that like open AI is able to use the internet um, and, and through some combination of, you know, Google books and human ego posting our every thought online, you know, there is a lot of data that's available for folks like open AI, but biology is not the same way. You know, you've got a few public databases um, that have a few hundred million kind of genome sequences. You've got a handful of, of folks that have tried to aggregate structural data and functional data. Um, but the public databases just aren't there in the same way. Um, And so when the conversation around AI really shifted to one that was kind of data first and not just algorithm first, Ginkgo plays a pretty unique role there because what we have built in, in our headquarters in Boston is a highly automated wet lab that dramatically reduces the cost of generating exactly the kind of labeled data that you need to train generative AI models. Um, And so, you know, for the for the large cloud providers, they're obviously really interested in like, how do we get all these major strategic industries using more compute, right? It's as simple as that. Um, But for a place like Google, if they go work with one big pharma 
that doesn't help them work with another big pharma. They, they don't, there are no network effects between cloud usage between big pharma companies. But if they work with Ginkgo, and if Ginkgo is building a foundation model that is then used by those big pharma companies, then supporting Ginkgo's development of these types of models and tools is actually helping advance the entire industry into a much more computationally forward space. Um, and so I think that's really how how Google looked at it. Um, you know, we had gotten to know the DeepMind team a little bit. And, and for them, I think the real recognition was that what Ginkgo has built is a closed loop system. So you've got folks at DeepMind who are truly some of the best uh, you know, AI engineers in the world building these incredible tools and algorithms that are spitting out predictions, but for them, they don't have that closed loop system. So how do we know if those predictions are any good in the absence of a ton of public data? Well, you want to actually go build those proteins and see if they're doing the thing that you think they're going to do. And, and that's the type of work that Ginkgo can do. And so I think when Google saw, you know, our capabilities and recognized the role that we could play in advancing this whole industry, um, they got really excited to support us. And so um, we partnered with them both on the cloud side, but then also they are um, uh, helping, you know, fund the development of our foundation models. How does AI powered bioengineering differ from like, say, the traditional bioengineering methods that are currently out there? That's a great question. Um, so I think it's a, there's a continuum. So if you think about what's happening in most laboratories, you've got a human being at a bench moving a lot of clear liquids around. That is literally how we code biology today. You move clear liquids around. It's kind of like punch cards. Um, and they are, the human being is thinking through all right, what do I know about biology? And based on what I know about biology and what all the literature says, what do I think is going to work? And I've, I've only got my two hands, so I've got a very limited set of resources available to me to, to, to design my experiments. And so I've got to be really thoughtful about what I do. And that's sort of the academic model today, even the kind of big pharma model today. Um, Go's approach to that initially was, well, let's let's fix the scale problem. OK, like we need to allow the scientists to make a lot more guesses because the reality is we just don't know that much about biology as human beings yet. And so we need to allow the scientists to search a much broader space, because what's happening now is if the scientist gets lucky, they're finding a local maxima. They're never finding the global maxima because they can't afford to take those sort of out of the box experiments that look like they probably won't work. They don't have any real reason to work, but might actually teach you something that gets you to a totally different space. Um, and so Ginkgo has focused on that sort of experimental design and scale and automation problem. And that then allows you to get to the next step, which is, well, now you have data. What do you do with all that data? And the thing that's really interesting about AI and biology is that the bar is a lot lower for computational tools to actually be better than a human, right? Like we invented human language. We know when it doesn't look and sound quite right. And so there's a really high bar for somebody like OpenAI to make ChatGPT something that impresses us. It's a really low bar for a model to find patterns in a whole bunch of ACs, Ts, and Gs, or assay data, you know, just giant, giant uh, bundles of letters and numbers that don't have any, like, obvious to a human eye meaning, it's a lot easier for that to add value to our workflows um, than it is in, in, in human language. And so that's sort of where we are now, is when you have enough data, and especially when you can build these closed loop systems, you can design much more thoughtful and predictive experiments from the beginning, benefit from all your prior learning. Yeah, not a lot of people seem to understand that, um, like large language models like OpenAI or something like that, um, is not only meant for language itself, but you can, you know, fine tune models for like amino acids, uh, you know, th these like really cool methods that, um, that, that you don't really think of in, unless you're in that space. And so yeah. I, I find it very, um, intriguing that a lot of like, um, biotech companies are beginning to understand that there's, you can use gen AI in the field of biology in order to gain insights into something as unique as like a, like a 2d sequence. Um, my background is, you know, I, I was in the hard sciences. Um, I was actually one of the inventors for the automated gel electrophoresis. 
and the um like automated um smart test tube holder like uh i actually invented this thing where you could um uh, it's like a little module that fits into a centrifuge bucket it's got a computer system and some sensors on there and you would just put your the centrifuge test tube in there and it just monitors uh, sample sedimentation uh, in real time as it's spinning inside of a centrifuge. Right. So like, you know, I, I used to do that. All, like I used to build a ton of scientific equipment uh, way back right. when I was in the hard sciences. So I can totally relate with that. Um, so like in, in your opinion, like what, what do you think are like the challenges that um, like do you anticipate when you're trying to uh, like translate the language of like DNA using AI models? Like, have you guys hit like roadblocks when you're trying to translate that stuff? Um, any like tips and tricks that you learned along the way? Well, I think the real challenge is that for these models to be really useful in our space, they have to be inherently multimodal, right? Like we, we don't speak DNA as humans. And so the most helpful way for us to engage with one of these models is is to be able to interact with it in, in human language and 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 then have the model interact with many other languages right it's not just a dna sequence or an rna sequence or a protein sequence it's also um assay data which could take many different forms and formats and and so to make these models as powerful as they can be and we'd like to make them you you need to figure out how to link many different forms of data together in one model. And I think that's going to be the biggest challenge here. Um, the way we're approaching it right now is that you would, let's just say you're building a protein foundation model. That model needs to understand proteinness, <laughs> right? Like you're just feeding it a lot of se uh, protein sequences and it starts to understand, well, you know, these amino acids tend to go together and, you know, there's some, and in this class of enzymes, you've got some, you know, similarity in these, in these areas. And then on top of that, sure, you can, you can build kind of task specific applications or fine tuned models that take into account, um, you know, the, the kind of core functional questions you want to ask around, you know, sensitivity, specificity, um, binding strength, thermostability, immunogenicity, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and that's the way that we're approaching it now. But, um, but over time, I think it'll be really interesting to see just how much complexity that we can build into the, the core fabric of these models. So um, a lot of people have you know, said that DNA is like the the code of life, right? So how would you, like in just layman's terms, um, like how do you read and write this code? Um, you know, for like audiences that are not well versed in in like the, the hard sciences. Sure. Um, I mean, the reality is that we are still at a stage where we are borrowing a lot from from, from nature and or from prior experiments that already worked. And so we have a pretty good understanding of, you know, you might call it the syntax of the, of the language, right? We know what, uh, what a series of, of letters of DNA letters means that you start reading a gene. We know what series of letter mean, letters means you stop reading a gene, you know, what a period is. Um, we understand uh, the types of sequences that act as what are called promoters. In other words, this is going to help this gene get read. Um, so we, we understand certain features of the code and we can start to abstract a little bit away from just a C T T T G G G A A, you know, into okay. Pro, here's a library of promoters. Here's a library of proteins that share a certain characteristic. Um, here's a library of promoters that are specifically targeted to this type of tissue. You know, so you start to build these these libraries. Really, um, at Ginkgo we call it code base. Um, sort of borrowing from the the world of software, um, and then you're you're making relatively small tweaks to those libraries um, that are informed, you know, presumably. But you're making a, a tweak to an existing template, and then seeing what happens. We, we're not yet at a stage where anyone could reasonably sit down and say, "All right, A, C, T, T, G, G." I think that the next level level of abstraction would be something like, "Okay, well, I I need a protein that does these things." Okay, so first it needs to have a binding domain that targets this type of substrate. And then I need it to also, um, you know, uh, be invisible against these types of, uh, you know, human immune reactions. And so I'm gonna, I'm gonna tack on a few other 
elements of code base, but I know achieves that purpose. And I need this thing to be stable in the human body without getting denatured. So it needs, you know, it needs to be thermostable up to some temperature. And I, I know I can throw this piece on it. And you, you can imagine it almost like a parts library that you can tack together. Um, I think that's kind of the next, the probably the, the, the most uh, available next layer of abstraction. Um, but it'll probably be a little while before you're writing Python code and out pops a you know, a, a protein or something. <laughs> in your opinion, like in what ways will AI or like bioengineering, like how's that going to accelerate innovation um, in, in, in this like field? Like, uh, do you think that it's going to um, like be like a, like a job replacer? Is it going to um, like help um, uh, alleviate all of the, like the guesswork like what, what, like how would AI fit into like the bioengineering space as like a tool? Is it going to be like a tool or is it going to be like a replacement for something? I think it's a, I think it's largely a tool, but I think the real sort of innovation comes from what are the types of questions that we can start trying to answer because now the easy ones have been solved. The reality is it is still extraordinarily expensive to develop new product, new biological products. It is extraordinarily expensive to experiment. And if we can reduce the number of, you know, engineering cycles that are needed to get to a result that is informative, that opens up a much, much, much wider set of questions that we can go tackle, right? So rather than just asking the simple question of, you know, like, how do I build an antibody that goes and targets that particular disease? Could you think about a much more, um, you know, whether it's a personalized medicine that reacts to your specific condition, um, whether it is able to have certain logic built into it from the beginning so that you're reducing side effects or you're increasing potency, um, whether you're able to just reach different parts of the body, now this is what we're talking about therapeutics, but like reach different parts of the body that are currently um, unaddressable. Um, but I, you know, to be clear, while some of the easiest applications are in, in drug discovery and, and, and in pharmaceuticals, I think there's a whole world outside of that that gets opened up when biology becomes cheap. Um, most of what we live around is biology fundamentally, right? Like we are biology, sure, that's how we eat biology. All of our food is biological. Um, our ecosystem, our planet, most of our building materials at one point or another came from biology. Our energy, you know, fossil fuels came from fossils. Those were living organisms, right? And so if you just think about what could be possible by replacing carbon-based substances that are currently made through chemistry and physics with renewable biology, there is a huge market and, and opportunity that opens up outside of biopharma that today is inaccessible because it's just too it's just too expensive. And, and so I get really excited too about about really being able to catalyze a much broader um, ecosystem enabled by biology. For people who are outside of the um, the life sciences space, um, they might have some problems with like, you know, scientists trying to manipulate or alter DNA. Like what are some like ethical concerns or challenges that you're, that like people face um, when they're trying to manipulate and alter like the, the, the core, uh, you know, code of life? Yeah, I think it's really important to have, you know, open discussions about this. I think one major cultural difference that, um, we've you know sort of adopted as core to core to the company we've built versus what you sort of see in the tech industry is that we feel very responsible for what happens on our platform i think if you if you think about tech platform business models for a long time you know for 20 plus years the prevailing culture was we're just the pipes we're not responsible for what goes through our pipes you know your kids addicted to social media like you should you should take the phone away from them. We're not responsible for that, right? You're you're getting misinformation on 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 you know your your favorite platform. Like you're an adult. You 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 should be responsible. Not not us, right? That's obviously changing. But even from the very earliest days of Ginkgo, we're a 15 year old company. Like we knew we couldn't take that approach. Like this is 
this is biology. Like this is, this is life that we're talking about. And so we have to be very, we have to be responsible for what is built on our platform. Um, and the, the way we've approached that is there's sort of two, two sides to it. Um, one is, uh, we do have a committee that reviews every program that we take on to review, you know, ethical um, uh, questions and considerations of those programs. Um, but then there's also a biosecurity angle, right, which is to make sure, you know, no customer should ever be able to use our platform to make a, uh, you know, a bioweapon, for example. Um, and and in particular, I think our, uh, you know, the the recognition there was, look, even if Ginkgo's platform is secure. Biology doesn't respect borders, and, and there are lots of folks that are working on synthetic biology, and, and this field is going to advance, and it's imperative that we build biosecurity, and who better to understand the potential risks than this platform that, you know, kind of is building this really deep understanding of biology, and so we've expanded our biosecurity kind of practice and model far beyond our platform, um, but into things like COVID response and international pathogen surveillance um, and analytics to help uh, identify when threats are emerging and 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 hopefully help help folks respond to those as well. In terms of like bioengineering, what what are some like big risks for that? Is is it just like is is it just um, basically someone's able to take like uh, something and then be able to like weaponize it? Is that, is that like the biggest risk? Cause I, I think there was a, um, there was a research group that took a, I think it was like some type of flu and like made it airborne and more contagious. And then they got into the scuffle with like the U S government over trying over releasing um, it as a publication, because like the U S government said that, you know, another foreign entity could go and take that same paper and duplicate that as a weapon uh, but then, like the researchers were saying, like this is just going to forward like the the progress of like the feel as a whole, so that they can understand how it works. Like, um, I I think you know, other than like weaponizing it, are, are there any other like potential risks involved in like this field? I mean, I think there there are inherently risks. Um, you know, and and in, in particular, you know, in biology, we are again, we are made of biology, and so we are susceptible to biological threats. I think, yes, you could imagine that people will make bioweapons if they get good enough at engineering. I think, you know, good news is that it's still pretty hard to engineer biology. Um, and so it's not something you can, you know, kid can do in, in their basement. But, um, uh, but, but again, I think like, regardless, honestly, of, of what you could imagine someone doing with bioengineering, like, there's a lot of nasty biology that's out in the world anyway. Mother Nature just throws it at us. And so our view is like, we shouldn't wait to get scared about some person, some country, some lab doing nasty things with biology. Like it, you know, that, that would be waiting far too long. Like we have already experienced a global pandemic that basically shut down world economies for a couple of years. Like we need to be building this now and, and fast. And it doesn't matter if it's natural, if it's man-made, like the same types of systems are going to be what protect you, right? Whether it's a bug in the system or a uh, intentional threat or just bad luck, um, we need to be able to respond to it. So um, how are like the innovations in synthetic biology like currently being applied to like other other industries like healthcare, agriculture, maybe even manufacturing. Yeah. Are, are, are they are they are you are you seeing um, synthetic biology going into different sectors other than the healthcare life sciences? Absolutely, and and you know sometimes surprising to folks, Ginkgo's business today is about evenly split between pharma. Um, kind of industrial biotech and agriculture. Um, so what I sort of consider the three main verticals for uh, for biology. Um, and so we we absolutely see as much both near and long-term potential outside of pharma as we see inside pharma. Um, just to give you a sense of the types of projects we're working on. So, you know, in the industrial space, there's a huge push towards renewability. How do we get rid of uh, chemical processes that are damaging to the environment, either in the production of certain chemicals or the waste of those chemicals, and how can we replace those with um, both renewable and potentially biodegradable substances. Um, and so you see us working with like, materials companies, chemicals companies in that space, folks like Solvay and Sumitomo 
Um, in the agriculture space, this is an area where if you just think about um, both the concentration of agriculture around the world and the importance of agriculture and food shortages that are being faced around the world, um, this is a, a hugely, hugely important space. Um, and there, you know, again, like if you look at the European Union, they've essentially out, you know, they've, they've promoted a plan to uh, restrict the use of very, very common and important, you know, pesticides and fertilizers and things like that. And we need a replacement for that. And so um, we're doing a lot of work in that space with folks like Bayer, Corteva, Syngenta um, to do everything from engineering better crops themselves to um, and finding the, the types of traits that are going to be useful for them to engineering biological solutions that could, for example, replace fertilizer. Um, just one of my favorite statistics is Nitrogen-based fertilizers are about 5% each of global greenhouse gas emissions and global energy consumption. It's just crazy. Um, and most of what we apply to our fields doesn't end up in the crop itself. It ends up in the local water stream where it kills the animal life and re you know, results in algae blooms and things like that. And so it's just a hugely inefficient process, but we rely on it to get the food that we eat. And so if you could replace that with natural processes that self-fertilize the plants, it's, it's hugely powerful. Um, and then obviously in, in pharma, uh, doing a lot of work in programmable medicines. So things like RNA therapeutics, we have a program with Pfizer in that space, um, cell and gene therapies, um, as well as the production of, of, of medicines. Um, so a lot of medicines are made with biology, even if the drug itself is a small molecule. Um, and so, uh, you know, it, it's a more industrial process, but important for human health as well. So have you seen the movie um, Inception with like Matthew McConaughey? It has been years, but at yeah. some point, yes, I saw that. You'll, you might have to remind yeah. me of the plot. It's a, it, you know, it's a, it, the, um, Planet Earth is hit with like blight, and it's basically when the, the it's a disease uh, where like there's like browning or death of like the plant tissue. Um, yeah. That could be like a big problem in our at, like you know in the future for us. Um, and I was just wondering if like you've seen the movie and like well, if you had a, it's not in the movie. future though. That's the thing. Well, I, hope, like, I hope not. <laughs> we we are we are already facing massive agricultural issues around drought. Like some of the programs our our partners are working on are are things like drought resistant crops because weather patterns are already different on our planet. Like it, it is it is here now. Um, we have huge risks with certain monoculture crops to disease. Um, like we wouldn't have certain fruits today if it were not for genetic engineering because the original species was wiped out by a disease. Um, and so, you know, th this is this is here today. Like genetic engineering is critically important to maintaining our food supply. And, and again, to your questions earlier about, you know, ethics, I, I think it's really a question of trust. I, you know, I think if you look at the, like GMOs are a bad word, um, you know, around the world, but also we rely on GMOs to feed a, a planet. And, and I think the reason it's a bad word is, uh, you know, the industry tried to hide it for a long time and, and I think lost a lot of consumer trust in that process. And, and so we've always been very, you know, like open and transparent around like, okay, this is, this is a science. This is how we do it. This is why this is, you know, and, and I think involving people in that conversation is a really critical aspect of advancing any technology, but especially anything biological. If I had to get in touch with you, like, how do I do that? Sure. Um, I would recommend folks email um, our AI inbox. So it's, it's pretty easy. It's AI at ginkgobioworks.com. And then like, just looking forward, like, like, where do you see the field of synthetic biology in, like, say, like the next five years? Like, do you have any predictions? Gosh, you know, it's um, we are at the intersection of so many exponential technologies, and when you are at, you know, that steep part of the curve, it's it's really hard to see, you know, even five years ahead. I, I look at just the progress that we've made and the types of problems we're able to work on today versus when I joined Ginkgo four years ago, and it's it's absolutely mind bending. Um, I, I do think in five years there will be a, a large set of the problems that we work on today will be trivialized five years from now. Like they will be pro problems that we can largely answer in a computer. And what that will do is that will have opened up a much broader set of, of questions that we actually can tackle and answer. And in just the same way that 
you know, the advancement of computing technology changed the types of programs that you could create, the advancement of biological technology will change the kind of programs we can create. Like early computers were calculators at best, right? Like the, the concept of even building chess on a computer was kind of crazy at the, in the very earliest days. And then the concept of building graphics on a computer, and then the concept that you and I would be chatting with each other over video chat, you know, all of those were almost unthinkable concepts in the early days of computer programming. And, you know, Tom Knight, who's one of our co-founders, he was you know, sort of in that era of computer programmers. And he was, he, it, it, they were talking about how much compute they were going to buy at MIT. And he was like, that's crazy. You know, like, we're never going to use that much. And it was, you know, it was like, maybe some, I, I don't know, a, a thousand, it was, well, I don't even think it was measured in megabytes at that stage. You know, it was just like laughably small amounts. Um, and so I think we're sort of in that same, in that same era for, for biology. Rehearsals for the school play were really coming along. Bigger smile, Mr. Squirrel. Until a custodian accidentally threw away the costumes. Oh no. Everyone was rattled. Miss Garrity forgot how to play. And the queen of the hedgehogs almost quit. Find a new queen. But replacement costumes were shipped with FedEx. And with added peace of mind from picture proof of delivery, everyone could focus on the perfect opening night. FedEx, where now meets next. For residential delivery only. First, the bad news. SAP Business AI won't help you generate cubist versions of your family's holiday photos. But it will help you understand which supplier is best to help you roll out your plant-based packaging in Southeast Asia. Or identify the training your junior project manager needs to rise up the ranks. And automate repetitive tasks while you focus on big innovations. So you can be ready for the next opportunity. Revolutionary technology. Real-world results. That's SAP Business AI. For the last question, like how... How would you get involved in like the world of synthetic biology if you were like not in that field? Like, like, uh, are there there any like tips and tricks? Or is, is, do you have to go through formal training, like su such as like um like higher education in order to understand it? Like, what are some ways that people can just get involved um in this field? Well, I think you know, like Ginkgo is really trying to make it much more accessible. Um, many of our customers don't actually have a biology team in house. What they have is a product development team, and they understand what's needed in their market, what the solution is. You know, whether it is a uh, you know, biodegradable chemical or a food product that has a certain taste and texture, they understand product, um, but they don't necessarily understand biology. And yet they're working for a synthetic biology company. And, and the way they're able to do that is they're able to leverage in our, you know, in this case, Ginkgo's expertise to do that R&D and to, to help them with that, that process. Um, and so I think it's, it's hopefully becoming a much more accessible field. Um, you know, even in terms of just working in the lab, um, a lot of the automation that we're able to bring in allows really complex workflows to be done by folks that don't have advanced degrees in biology. And, and one of the things, you know, I'm, I'm most proud of is that we've created new pipelines for, for early talent into our field. Um, and so I, I, you know, certainly there's, there's a huge need for more great uh, biologists, you know, whether lab scientists or computational biologists, but I do think there's a, it, it will become easier and easier to get involved in biology in the coming years. Well, thanks so much um, for showing up on the show. And until next time, stay curious. Thanks for having me.